Welcome to this evening's BA Historical Section webinar, or uh, good morning for Professor Nick Lom, who's uh, giving the talk from Australia today. Uh, we're broadcasting live on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, you can ask questions by typing them into Q&A on Zoom or the comments in YouTube, and we'll come to them at the end of the presentation. It's my pleasure to hand over to Mike Frost, the director of the BAA Historical Section. Thank you very much, Andy, and thanks for uh, for organising this this webinar. Um, uh, uh, good evening to everybody in the UK. Good day to you all in Australia, and uh, welcome to everybody else from around the world. I hope that we will have people watching from from all over. Um, the we aim to uh, aim to have some sort of um, uh, 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 event for the historical section. Uh, uh, at least once a year. Uh, for many years, those were uh, were um, uh, real world meetings, and then the pandemic happened, and like everybody else, we went online, and we found that there was a there's another audience that was really appreciated us holding webinars uh, that people who can travel to our uh, real world events either because they're too far away or because they weren't able to travel. So we've we've kept them on. Uh, we had an excellent one last year from Wayne uh, Professor Wayne Orcheston, uh, and uh, and and tonight from from somebody else from Australia. So uh, uh, it's it's good. It's uh, we're a very connected world these days that we can we can get speakers from from all over. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, 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 Nick Lom. He's a, a historic. Um, he's a sorry, a, um, a professor with the University of Southern Queensland. Has guided Australians in all things astronomical for decades. As the author of the international best-selling Transit of Venus, 1631 to the present day. I have a copy which I reviewed for the uh, BAA. It's a lovely book, uh, well worth a read. And uh, the annual Australasian Sky Guide uh, and also Eclipse Chasers, uh, another book uh, that he wrote or edited in conjunction with uh, another friend of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Turner Stevenson, uh, all about uh, Australian eclipses um, because uh, we just started a whole uh, a whole string of them in uh, down, uh, down under in that part of the world. Um, Nick was the uh, Powerhouse Museum, Sydney Observatory Astronomy Curator for 30 years. Since 2012, he's researched and written about the history of astronomy in Australia. Nick has experienced three total solar eclipses. I think we were chatting beforehand. Uh, um, uh, so at least three of the people on the panel were uh, were in, uh, up in uh, in Queensland in 2012 for the eclipse, in, including myself. So it's absolute absolute pleasure to hand over to uh, Professor Nick Lum to tell us about Australian eclipses. Nick. Oh, good evening, all. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mike. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. And... Um, thank you all for uh, tuning in, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching the recording. Uh, what I would like to tell you about is two eclipses in Australia uh, in 1857 and 1871. They are the first two eclipses uh, in Australia after European settlement. The First Nations people of Australia, of course, had been watching the sky for tens of thousands of years and had a good knowledge of eclipses. However, uh, these, are the, these two are the first two after European settlement. They're of particular interest because uh, they were major advances in technology between 1857 and 1871. And these are very uh, highly, illust highly illustrated by uh, these two eclipses. Um, we think of uh, technological changes happening today um, with internet or artificial intelligence or uh, RNA vaccines, but changes did happen or already um, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, the two main ones, of course, being uh, uh, rail, rail transport, and that in Australia was uh, started to spread out in cities um, in the 1850s, and uh, the telegraph is the second one, and that spread even more quickly in Australia and uh, various states, at least in the eastern part of the continent, were connected by the telegraph by the 1860s. There were also changes, as we'll see in a few moments, um, in astronomy, 
and that's what's illustrated by these two eclipses. Um, what we're looking at on the in the image is uh, a scene from the 1871 eclipse, um, a, a ship, a steamship, though with sails as well, uh, the governor Blackhall anchored of the of an island in the far north Queensland, um, which the astronomers called the uh, Eclipse Island. Um, now, as Mike said, um, I've written my colleague Tony Stevenson a book called Eclipse Chasers, and this talk um, is based is based on a chapter from that book, uh, specifically chapter three, and. Just mentioning the people involved in the book, even though Turner and myself are the main authors, we had other contributing authors who really uh, made a big difference to the book. Um, we had uh, Twain Hamaker and Uncle Gilar Michael Anderson talking about the First Nations people of Australia's uh, knowledge of uh, eclipses, and that's quite surprising amount that uh, was known. And we had also contributions from uh, Melissa Halbert, Jeff White, Jeffrey White, and Kirsten Banks. And these are the two eclipses that I'm uh, I'm talking about. Um, these are their eclipse tracks. The first one in 1857 was in uh, Eastern Australia, and most importantly, it went through uh, to down or city of Sydney, uh, which was then and it still is uh, the largest uh, largest city in Australia. The 1871 track was in far was in the northern part of Australia and uh, not easily accessible from uh, where most people were living down in the eastern part of the country. But uh, we'll go through that in a bit more detail. But it certainly gives you, for those of you who are not familiar with Australia, this map gives you an idea, uh, hopefully. So let's look at the uh, 1857 eclipse in, in a little bit more detail. And this uh, uh, this map actually shows the actual eclipse limits. So it covered uh, not only Sydney, but to Venturi um, country town of Bathurst. And it also went through two nearby towns in uh, or townships near Sydney, Sydney, Parramatta, and Windsor. Um, these were uh, separate little townships at the time, but in fact, uh, today they are they are suburbs of uh, of Sydney. The eclipse on the twenty sixth of March, eighteen fifty seven, took place early in the morning. Sunrise was uh, 6 a.m. And uh, let me just move this. Um, and uh, the actual totality began um, about 40 minutes later. Three, three men of science or three uh, scientists watched the eclipse in 1857, um, they were the main observers, or the observers we know about. Um, the first of the ones I want to mention is the Reverend William Scott, who was the first New South Wales uh, government astronomer. Um, he had arrived five months earlier. He had previously been a maths lecturer at uh, Cambridge. He had no prior astronomical experience when he was uh, selected for the position by uh, the Astronomer Royal, George Erie. Um, so he spent a few weeks at, uh, at Greenwich to try and uh, hone up on his uh, astronomical knowledge. This is a map of central Sydney um, centred on, uh, on Sydney Harbour. Central Sydney on uh, on the harbour. Uh, Fort Phillip is where uh, Sydney Observatory is being built at the time. Um, Scott has only been in the country for a few uh, few months, so it, 
the building had only just started, so he wasn't living there. He was living somewhere around there in a in fairly central part of Sydney called Macquarie Street. Um, just to orient yourself on the map, those who are familiar with Sydney, the Sydney Harbour Bridge is uh, here, crosses here, obviously, very much later from the 1930s and not 1857. And the Opera House, the two Opera House is here, um, is, is about there. Um, Sydney Observatory, as I said, was uh, is it here at Fort Phillip. Um, I worked there, as Mike said, for uh, for 30 years. People used to come and uh, visitors who used to come and see me would uh, would look around and uh, and say, oh, you must really hate uh, getting to work in the morning uh, when they uh, saw the sites that, uh, you know, the harbour and the uh, and Harbour Bridge that could be seen from uh, seen from where I worked. So Scott in 1857 uh, was living in uh, somewhere around there. So he, he had to make his way all the way to uh, all the way to the coast because the eclipse was so in the morning, early in the morning. So the best way to best opportunity to see it was uh, was looking out over the ocean because the clip because uh, the eclipse was uh, very loud down totality would uh, was to take place very loud down in the in the east so he set up set up it was a 10 kilometer trip he set up set up near the Macquarie, the Macquarie lighthouse and uh, this is uh, this is the lighthouse a little bit later, but uh, it would have looked very similar in back in uh, 1857. All right, let's just go back to back, let's go back two screens. Um, so Scott uh, did the 10 kilometer trip out to the lighthouse. He had. Uh, a small portable telescope, 70 millimeter diameter portable telescope, and it was on an unstable mount. He had a micro at the telescope, he had a micrometer plus thermometers. Unfortunately, when the, the sun rose, um, it was uh, cloudy. There was a brief clear patch. During that time, Scott tried to measure uh, indentations he saw on the disk of the sun, a bit of micrometer, but uh, it didn't work because of danced unstable mounting. The only thing that he could uh, really take note of was uh, that you'll when the eclipse, when it really became dark, so when the totality took place, and he was pleased because it agreed with his uh, previous calculations. And calculations that he had published in uh, in the local newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald. This is lighthouse. The second person I like to tell you about is uh, the Reverend uh, William Branby Clark, who's uh, known as the Father of Australian Geology. He arrived from the UK in 18, uh, 1839. Um, I think he was the headmaster of a school in Parramatta for a number of years. Then in 1846, he moved to a church, St. Thomas's Church in North Sydney uh, um, as the vicar. But as well as his, his taking part in his, uh, in his duties at the church, he also travelled around the country surveying uh, the... Uh, geology of the colony, colony of New South Wales. He was the first to point out the possibility or likelihood that gold would be, would be uh, discovered in the colony. And so getting back to uh, our previous map of, uh, of Sydney Harbour, um, Clark was... Uh, working here at the church, St. Thomas's Church. He was going to accompany 
Scott out to Macquarie Lighthouse, but for some reason he couldn't. It was probably logistically too difficult to get across the harbour and go all the way to the lighthouse very early in the morning. So instead he set up nearby, um, nearby in North Sydney. Of course, that's a spot now. It's impossible to imagine that you would see anything there because it's full of uh, high-rise buildings, high-rise office buildings. Uh, from there, he had a good view towards the east, and he could even uh, even see through his telescope. He could see Scott at the at the lighthouse. He had a seventy-five millimeter telescope, so slightly larger than that what Scott had, and meteorological instruments. He was also clouded out, just like Scott at the uh, at the lighthouse. Um, he was watching Scott, but um, before totality, but during totality, Scott um, and the people around him, and there were a lot of people that he could see around Scott, um, just about disappeared. What uh, Clark said about the eclipse uh, was, uh, without wishing to be poetical, poetical, I cannot help saying that in the unusual darkness and gloominess, when the sun was shut out completely, the appearance of Sydney and her people was one which gave the idea of something terrible about to come upon them. Fortunately, nothing terrible did happen, at least at the time. The third, uh, third and uh, last uh, scientist I want to talk about in relation to 1857 eclipse was John Tebbett, who is a very well-known uh, amateur astronomer, or he was to become a very well-known amateur astronomer. He wasn't that well known at the time. He was uh, unusually for the time, uh, born in Australia, though of course his uh, father came from the UK. He was... Uh, it's 1857, he was still young, just 20, 22 years old, and he observed from where he lived in the town of Windsor, just outside, uh, at that time, just outside uh, uh, Sydney. So there is uh, just, again, same map as I showed before, just to remind you that uh, Windsor was uh, just to the north, uh, northwest of uh, Sydney. Again, of course, he was clouded out. He was uh, also pleased that his calculations for uh, beginning end of sunrise of totality were accurate. He also published, just like Scott, and in fact, before Scott, his predictions in the newspaper. Um, he wrote that um, he was watching with his father, uh, and he told his father just before. Uh, totality that uh, a distant uh, chimney, chimney of a steam mill, would disappear in one minute. And his father was most impressed when it did, in fact, disappear. Not only the scientists were watching, uh, watching the eclipse, there were also plenty of uh, uh, members of the public and uh, a newspaper columnist uh, called, called himself the One-Eyed Man uh, wrote as follows. And, and I, actually, I should say that he left his house, this One-Eyed Man left his house in central Sydney at four in the morning, and he spent the next two hours walking, picking flowers or running uh, to reach the vicinity of the lighthouse uh, by the time of dawn. And he wrote, besides the hundreds ac accompanying, ac occupying, occupying positions on elevated grounds in and about Sydney or wherever otherwise perched on housetops, for a view of this interesting event, there were perhaps about 200 persons, male and female, of a very respectable stamp, assembled at the lighthouse grounds. And the array of carts and wagonettes, cabriolets and cabs, carriages and buses, magnibuses and minibuses, about two score in all, 
together with what would have considered a very useful and valuable train of forces for Horn, Ca Horn Castle Fair. So certainly the eclipse created uh, a lot of interest among the public. Not everybody looked at the eclipse in uh, scientific terms. There is also a poem, and this is just one uh, one stanza from a, a poem that was uh, published in a newspaper uh, uh, called the Illawarra Mercury newspaper a few weeks after the eclipse, and I really like it, so I'll uh, I'll put it up there. What ails the regal sun? Thy beams are fading away, which late in custom splendour shone, so strong to usher in the day. And night, which fired down the west, thou hast hurled, again abruptly creeps upon the world. I think that's a nice description of a total eclipse. So that's basically what I want to tell you about the 1857 eclipse. So just as a sort of brief summary, it was watched by uh, individuals, individual scientists using small telescopes. Um, if, they, if, the, if it had not been, if the sky had not been cloudy, what could, all they could have done was do sketches of uh, sketches of, uh, of the sun and do timings, nothing else that they had the capability of doing at the time. Things changed after, very quickly after the 1857. Two German chemists, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen, and Robert Bunsen, of course, being a sort of famous uh, for Bunsen burners, which uh, some of the all the ones among you might have used at, uh, in chemistry labs at uh, high school. Um, so these two came up with, or discovered that it was possible to work out um, the nature of substances uh, from their spectra um, if they're heated. If they're heated. Um, and they used the spectroscope, and this is... Uh, can see the Bunsen burner on the right. Um, a sample is placed in, in it. So there is the sample. This part is the collimator, collimates the light from the flame. Then it goes through the prism, and then which is separates the light into a spectrum, and you watch the spectrum through a telescope. Astronomers always being early adapters, um, just in 1850s and 1860s, um, as they are today, they immediately took up the idea and, because it's an excellent way of working out what objects in the sky, distant objects, that it's impossible to sample, um, yet they could work out using a spectroscope what, uh, what they were made of. Another big, so this was spectroscopy, another big change in astronomy was uh, photography. And the first, now one of the first eclipse photographs was taken uh, by Warren de la Rue um, in an exp on an expedition to Spain for an eclipse, for a total eclipse on 18th, 18th of July, 1860. Combined with other photos um, taken at the same eclipse, um, it, could be shown by parallax that uh, prominences were associated with the sun. Until then, that was not known. People didn't know whether the prominences and the corona were uh, something in the Earth's atmosphere, something around the moon or around the sun. But finally, it could be shown with photography that uh, the prominences were uh, around the sun and similarly it, from drawings of the corona um, at the same eclipse, it showed that they were uh, around the sun. There's another eclipse from seen from India, 1868, when the spectroscope was first used. And that, with that, it was uh, an indication was picked up um, uh, for spectral life, a spectral line at that stage unknown on Earth, and that became uh, later known as helium. In uh, 
and they collapsed the following year in uh, from the United States from America. Um, a bright green line was seen in the corona, and that was uh, later called veronium, we now know as highly ionized iron. The planning for the 1871 eclipse in, in Australia began here at the Royal Society of Victoria, and this building still stands. It's in, uh, in the heart of Melbourne. And, uh, this is actually, in fact, this was where uh, this building, where uh, the Eclipse Chasers book was launched in, back in March of this year. But in 1871, there was a meeting on 12th of March, 1871. There were 28 members present. Uh, to, in, Robert Ellery, who is the director of Melbourne Observatory, um, director of government and uh, government astronomer, was in the chair. And at the end of the mill meeting, Professor William Parkinson Wilson, who is uh, Professor of Mathematics at the University of Melbourne um, stood up and mentioned or told the members that there would be an eclipse um, in December seen from far north Queensland. And he suggested how to get there by hiring a ship and uh, getting paying passengers for the ship and that would, that would uh, pay for the high fee of the ship. So again, just to remind you, here is the track of the 1871 eclipse. So they were in, uh, in Melbourne, Melbourne in Victoria, getting up to the eclipse. The most accessible spot was uh, here in Cape York, but to get there was uh, not really pos not possible by land. And there's what, no real system of roads. Obviously, there was no no planes. I mean, today, but easy to get up there quickly by uh, by plane. But so the only feasible way of getting there by ship. And um, they did the following uh, what the Professor Parkinson said. An advert was at first. Advertisement was placed in the papers uh, saying, uh, gentlemen desirous of joining the expedition must apply force feed enclosing 25 pounds at their share of the expense to Mr. Ellery at the observatory. List must close at the 20th of the instant, 20th of the month. Unfortunately, it didn't work. The, the advertisement wasn't very successful. Only 15 or 16 applicants though there was in, uh, insufficient funds to uh, to hire a ship. They had to ask money from the government and some money was forthcoming. Still not quite enough. Um, they did put out tenders for a ship, but they all came out more than was affordable. They more than the funds available. The problem was solved with a telegram from Henry Chamberlain Russell. Russell was the director of uh, Sydney Observatory in, uh, it's obviously in Sydney, um, and government astronomer for New South Wales. He'd only been in the job for one year, um, so he having been appointed in 1870. Um, he sent a telegram on the 28th of October, 1871, saying that the Queensland government had a ship in Sydney Harbour called the Governor Blackhall. It was not actually doing anything. And uh, so he offered, oh, the Queensland government had offered to lend the ship um, for the purpose of the eclipse for a relatively reasonable sum of uh, 1,300 pounds. 1,300 pounds, which would be about 130,000 uh, pounds per day. There still wasn't quite found some uh, enough money. Um, money came in from different contributions from different states, 
uh, South Australia, hundred pounds, Queensland, uh, Queensland, and three hundred pounds from New South Wales, and some extra money from Victoria, and eventually on the eleventh of November, um, a telegram was sent to Russell. You can finally accept the Blackwell offer. So the Melbourne people, the, the ship was uh, was hired or leased. Um, the Melbourne people left for Sydney on a commercial ship, and they included Ellery, the director of Melbourne Observatory, his chief assistant, Edward, Edward White, two other assistants, a photographer, Charles Walter, a newspaper writer, and... Professor Bilson. Another person who arrived in uh, in Sydney was uh, Sylvester Diggles. Um, he came from Queensland. He was the, it was a condition from the Queensland government that uh, somebody from Queensland be included in the expedition. So uh, Diggles came down, so the ship wouldn't have to stop at Brisbane on the way. Um, his, uh, Diggles was a naturalist, an artist, and a musician. They all went on board to Governor Blackhall, which left Sydney on 27th of November, 1871. The only person from Sydney was uh, Russell, Henry Chamber Russell, director of the observatory. His, his predecessor, or one of his predecessors, Reverend William Scott, whom we met for the, when he observed the 1857 eclipse, as amateur astronomer called Mac. Donald, William MacDonald, photographer Buford Merlin, and a conchologist who is the person who looks after shells called John Frazier. On the way up, and as they were nearing uh, Eclipsed Island, they stopped off at Fitzroy Island. Stopped off at Fitzroy Island, uh, where uh, some of them climbed the hill, hill and work out how high it was, um, while others went around uh, collecting specimens of birds. And uh, of course, uh, there's no idea of conservation in those days. So uh, any interesting looking bird they shot. Um, and they've, afterwards, uh, and they took them all on board. Uh, took those dead birds on, on board, which the steward didn't like. Um, they took, called the bonded naturalist Diggles to identify the birds. As they were getting near the, uh, near the track, eclipse track, they had to decide where to go. This is a hydrographic, hydrographic map. Uh, from uh, from the UK, um, presumably this is probably the one they used or something very similar, and they had to decide where where they're going to observe from, and of course this is uh, land and this is uh, this is the sea, and they need a Great Barrier Reef. Reef. Uh, they were aiming for Cape Sidmouth. This was the original original plan observation, but they realised from the map that the water around it were very shallow. Uh, well, this is in fathoms, very shallow, so the ship couldn't have approached very close, uh, which would have made it very difficult to land the instruments. So, and well, and then there was uh, another reason they didn't want Cape Sidmouth, it's because there was uh, in a, a rumour or indication that there are Aboriginal people there and uh, they were afraid of uh, of trouble. So they instead they decided to go to an island called Claremont Number 6, at least at that time called Claremont Number 6, or Number 6 of the Claremont group. This is uh, the island. Um, it's uh, it's a sandy. It's 
then, as I said, it was uh, then called number six of the Claremont group. The astronomers called it Eclipse Island. It's a sandy cay at uh, low tide. It's a reef. Uh, it's fairly large, 10 kilometres long and three kilometres wide. But at high tide, it's on near sandbank, eight, 800 metres long and 200 metres wide. So it's a very small and narrow sandbank at high tide. So that's where they could uh, set up uh, set up their uh, in tents and instruments. And uh, this is a view of the of the of the tents and uh, some of the telescopes can be seen on the right. And the ship, the Governor Blackhawk, is at anchor off the island. So the far off Eclipse Island being in far north. Means that. Ellery, uh, this is Ellery, director of Melbourne Observatory, was not, not uh, impressed by the place. He said it was the most uninviting place, a mere sandbank over which an eight foot or 2.4 metre tide would sweep close to and leave it a few miserable bushes infested with myriads of rats. So it was not an ideal spot, but uh, it was in a good location uh, to observe the eclipse. And this is uh, the eclipse party, um, all serious looking gentlemen. Uh, surprising, there is one or two uh, clean shaven. But uh, this is uh, people I could identify. There is Ellery, director of Melbourne Observatory, Russell, director of Sydney Observatory, Scott, who was the first government astronomer at, uh, in Sydney, Reverend William Scott, Professor Wilson, who came up with the idea for the, for the eclipse, Sylvester Dickles, the naturalist from, uh, from Brisbane, William MacDonald, the amateur astronomer uh, in, from New South Wales, Edmund, and Edmund White, uh, from, uh, who was the first assistant at Malcolm Observatory, Edward White. And this is Jack Gowland, who was uh, who was the captain of the ship. He was a British uh, Royal Navy officer who was at that time uh, stationed in Australia. New South Wales uh, party set up their equipment in one large tent, referred to not surprisingly, as the Sydney tent. And uh, Jack Gowland, the captain, was to use one small telescope. Sylvester Dickles was to use another small telescope. Reverend Scott was to, to use a slightly larger Troughton and Sims telescope. And the observer is in the observatory's largest telescope, which is seven and a quarter inch or 18 centimeter. Mertz telescope ordered by uh, Scott when he was governor astronomer uh, was to be used by Russell um, or with the assistance of uh, the photographer, a uh, photographer here, which is uh, uh, Merlin. They all said in the tent they had also photographic past because it, they were using. Uh, at that time, only it, the plates had to be wet plate. Only wet plate photography was being used. The plates had to be coated immediately before exposure, and developed very soon after exposure. Melbourne people did it slightly differently. They had small tents uh, for their equipment, so individual tents for their equipment, and there is uh, Ellery, and, uh, Professor, uh, 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 Professor uh, Wilson, Will, Wilson um, in front of the equipment. They were going to, Ellery was to use, to use the spectroscope. Spectroscopes were sent out from the, and other equipment were sent out from the UK by the Eclipse Committee of the BWAS, the British 
Association for the Advancements, Advan Advancement of Science. They also sent out polariscopes, and uh, Russell Wilson was to use a polariscope. Polariscopes being, of course, looking at polarization, and polarization indicates the presence of dust. And uh, the photographer Charles Walter was to take photographs. Edward White, the first assistant from Melbourne Observatory, was to was used a transit transit instrument um, in a small tent set up for the purpose, and he was he was uh, observed for longitude and latitude, and as well as for time. The latitude that he obtained was spot on. Longitude was uh, too far east by five kilometers which was pretty close for uh, for the time. Sadly, a tropical storm came in the night before. Um, this was uh, described by the photographer, Buffoy Merlin, as at last the thunder broke out, peel after peel, then volley after volley, like the rattle of artillery close at hand. The steamer shook and quivered in every part. Rain followed, such rain. Sadly, there was no improvement the next morning. There are a few little bits of, uh, of clear sky, but it's what uh, Eclipse watches today called, called sucker, sucker holes, sucker patches. Um, um, Brussels. Uh, Russell and the, the photographer helping him expose two plates but then nothing on it. So sadly they had to uh, pack up after the eclipse and they were uh, on board the ship to come to Blackhall by 5.30pm. To cheer themselves up they had uh, lots of toasts over uh, dessert. They uh, toasted the success to other eclipse expeditions, Professor Wilson, who uh, suggested this voyage, um, Australian governments who supported it, um, the leaders of the observing parties, Captain Gowland, and then finally the passengers. That this is this is uh, a view of. Uh, of totality, rain pouring down, clouds, and uh, there is a uh, the black hole um, burst uh, or anchored uh, in, close to the island. Now, after all those dates, they were probably in a good mood. The astronomers were probably had cheered up and were in relatively good mood. When they were visited, and another ship turned up a ship, a schooner called Matilda. And the officers from there, or the master and his colleagues uh, came on board and came on board Governor Blackhall and said, guess what we saw? We saw a total eclipse of the sun. And they were just about 40 kilometers north near an island called Night Island. And uh, they saw the eclipse, they didn't expect it. Um, they were cross-examined by Professor Wilson to make sure they really did see an eclipse, but it seems it did. So at that stage, they would have... Uh, to Ellery and Russell um, and Wilson would have had a bit of soul-searching to do whether they should have had uh, sent out parties at different places to make sure that if they cloud it out in one spot, it, they wouldn't be clouded out in another. But they did not do it. So the eclipse first uh, was a washout, like it was in 1857. But the eclipse still had considerable use. In fact, it's, it's, in fact, it's highly significant in the history of Australian science. This was the first time there was cooperation between states. First time there was government support, uh, government support for a scientific endeavor. 
um, the astronomers uh, gained considerable experience in organizing a large uh, logistics of a large, uh, large event or large expedition. Uh, they gained uh, experience in uh, obtaining funds from governments, um, in uh, looking after large sums of money. They gained experience with, in photography, they played photography. They gained experience in spectroscopy. So there were lots of advantages uh, despite the disappointment of clouds. Three years after the eclipse was the transit of Venus, which was uh, Australia was in an ideal spot to observe in 1974. And Sydney and Melbourne Observatory both sent out a number of observing parties scattered around their respective states, around uh, Victoria and New South Wales, um, to make sure that they wouldn't be, if one place was cloudy, they wouldn't be clouded out all over. They also, as I've said, became interested in spectroscopy. Russell travelled, was in Britain a year after the transit of Venus in 1875. He was there for the bicentenary dinner of uh, Greenwich Observatory on, uh, in 1875. And one of the things he did was to order a spectroscope to make sure uh, that's in the observatory spectroscope, and that was used occasionally. Well, it was used to observe a comet, among other things, in 1881. Melbourne Observatory, as I said, received a number of instruments from uh, the Eclipse Committee of the uh, BWAS, uh, spectroscopes, polariscopes, and also a long focus uh, lens. They were happy to, or would have been happy to return it back to the UK, but the Eclipse Committee said, you can have a, um, said you're welcome to it and you can keep it. So that was an uh, unexpected gift, which they happily ac accepted. It turned out though, when uh, Ellery, as well as Russell, was in the uh, UK in 1875, that there had been considerable problems with that gift. It turned out the Eclipse Committee of the BWAS didn't own those instruments, but they belonged to the Royal Astronomical Society, and uh, they weren't happy with the, uh, it, it having been gifted to Melbourne Observatory. This is uh, Morris Island today, or this is Eclipse Island today. Today it's known as Morris Island. I was hoping that having done the research on the 1871 eclipse, it might be possible to get the name of the island changed back to Eclipse Island, but it turned out that there was another island um, somewhat to the south, uh, 600 kilometres to the south, uh, called Eclipse Island. And that seems to have been named after a, a Royal Navy ship called HMS Eclipse, who, who must have visited uh, that island, um, Eclipse Island. Today, so this is Morris Island, Eclipse. Our Eclipse Island is now Morris Island today. Um, it's full of uh, size, a sisal size, size plant, which is an uh, invasive uh, species. There has been plans to uh, restore its original native vegetation, but it hasn't happened as yet. The eclipse uh, was clouded out for astronomers, uh, observationally at least, it was not a, not a success, but for naturalists it was the most successful. Uh, Sylvester Dickles uh, collected a huge number of uh, insects, which, uh, which he was happy to, happy to have. The conchologist, John Brazier, found many new shells, which have previously been unknown, and he named some of these after the astronomers on board the ship. It was Russell, who there were two shells named after Russell, one after Ellery, 
one after the amateur astronomer MacDonald, one after Scott, one after the first assistant at Melbourne Observatory, White, one silver from after Sylvester Dickles. But there were three after the captain of the ship, Jack Gowland. And that was turned out to be rather sad because uh, as Brazy wrote in uh, in the dedication of one of uh, one of the shells named after Gowland, I've named it after my late lamented friend John to Thomas Ewing Gowland, staff commander, Royal Navy, was unfortunately drowned while employed surveying Port Jackson, that is Sydney Harbour, in August 1874. So that's a rather sad ending to uh, Jack Gowland. We started off by talking about the 1857 eclipse, which went through Sydney. That was the last eclipse that was uh, that went through Sydney. But there's one coming up in in five years' time, um, on 26th of July 2028, which will be visible above Sydney. Hopefully, this time the sky will be clear. Um, July, I think there's a better chance um, that the sky will be clear and then there'll be opportunities for some fantastic uh, photographs like this artist impression of what uh, the totality could look, would look like over the Sydney, uh, Sydney Opera House with Harbour Bridge in the background. So that would be something if any of you are planning to come to Australia, uh, for the eclipse, it's certainly something highly worthwhile. And finally, just a reminder that this was uh, talk was based on uh, the Eclipse Chasers book. Um, it is available internationally, visible, available in the UK. Um, I did a quick web search. I found it's available from Foils from £27.95, um, probably. On the internet, you might find other places which are cheaper. And from Australia, uh, in Australia, the recommended retail price is $39.99. And that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I'm happy to try and answer questions. Thank you very much, Nick. That was a fascinating story. Um, the um, I'm very pleased that you finished off by telling us about the uh, the the Sydney eclipse in, in 2028. I have every intention of being somewhere in New South Wales. Um, um, uh, if I could just start by asking you a question, do you know uh, whether or not Sydney is the best place in New South Wales to view it from? Should you go inland for better weather? Um, it does it go? It does it extend further across Australia? Yeah, it it does. It up to the north through Western Australia and the Northern Territory. And if you a really keen eclipse watcher and would prefer uh, to maximise your chances of a clear sky, then uh, certainly you would go up to west, go to Western Australia or the Northern Territory. And uh, I think it goes uh, through a um, through place called Devil's Marbles, which would also provide great opportunities to, uh, for photographs. So best chance of a clear sky up in the uh, in the Northern Territory or Western Australia, but the most exciting place to watch it from, I think, would be Sydney with uh, five million other people and with uh, and with the fantastic sight of the uh, Opera House and Harbour Bridge. But it just depends what you're after. Yeah. Yes, I was. I was in Exmouth. Say earlier in the year, and uh, in Western Australia, delivered for completely clear skies. So uh, I can I can vouch that the, the, that uh, they 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 usually clear skies at that part of the world. But as you say, uh, Sydney's just just the extraordinary backdrop for a city for an eclipse with the with the Harbour mm. Bridge, just 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 wonderful. Okay, I'm going to hand over to uh, Andrew to uh, to uh, see if there are any more questions come in by uh, our routes. Yeah, and thank you, Nick, for a fascinating talk. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, then you can type them in the Q&A on Zoom. You should find a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you're on YouTube, then if you type in the uh, comments. 
And thanks also to Nick for getting up um, extra early to give us uh, this talk today. So I think just approaching 8 a.m. in Melbourne, is that right? That's correct. Well, 8 a.m. is a perfectly respectable time now. But yes. <laughs> I did have to get up a little bit early. Yes, I imagine the, so sometime shortly after six. I... Yeah, but it's it's first of all, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. I like the um, uh, the marketing in 1871, no expense spared. There's a sort of five or six line um, uh, classified ad saying, do you want to go and see an eclipse? But presumably there was a little bit more of advertising of it than, than just a, something on it's something hidden in the classified ads in the newspapers. I'm not sure. I mean, presumably the members of the Royal, so Royal Society of Victoria would have known about it, but the general public... I'm not sure there's any other way except that classified ad. Yeah, perhaps um, that's all they had in those days, yes. yes the ad did say gentlemen, um, gentlemen who want to go to the eclipse, but they did clarify uh, that ladies would have been welcome as well. But somehow no ladies applied to go on the expedition. So it was sort of exclusively male uh, male uh, domain i know my uh, uh, my predecessor the uh, the first director of the historical section uh, mary evershed or mary or as she was who is friends with john tebbett i'm sure she sure she would have uh, she would have gone if uh, had she been i don't think i can't remember if she's alive at that stage she certainly wasn't in australia but she uh, she uh, she was in australia in the in the 1880s 1890s wasn't she and so uh, and she mm -hmm. she went to Wallal in uh, in western australia in uh, in uh, 1923 to see the eclipse there that's right uh, so I think she would have uh, she would have volunteered had she been had she been old enough to do so. I'm sure she'd have been on the trip. Yes, yes. I did feel for them having a tropical storm just at the eclipse after all that effort, uh, and then to come across a boat which had just been a little way away to have seen it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, it often happens with eclipses. So that's yes. at a risk. Um, as Mike said in the introduction, I've seen three eclipses. I've been fortunate with all three, but other people have not been. Um, the three I saw was uh, 2004, which I saw from uh, Woomera in South Australia, Woomera being the rocket range. So it was, you know, I was very excited when I first uh, plotted the eclipse in those days. Um, back in 2004, there was no uh, no Google Maps, so basically I had to uh, plot the eclipse from the coordinates uh, given, uh, plotted on uh, photocopies of uh, from an atlas, and uh, plotted it, and then, and then I saw it was going to pass through Woomera, the rocket range. So I made sure uh, I arranged to be there, and I organised a expedition from uh, Powerhouse Museum or, yeah, from Powerhouse Museum uh, to go and visit uh, visit Woomera at the time of the eclipse. I think there were quite a, quite a number of BAA members in in Woomera for that eclipse. So, as you say, the the, uh, the 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 rocket range was a was a uh, was a draw as well for people. I, I was the other side of the Indian Ocean. I was on the coast of Mozambique, and we had a big black cloud that uh, that covered the uh, covered the sun just as the eclipse was the totality was starting. Oh. We saw about the first third of a second. And uh, and then the big cloud, the black cloud covered it for the rest of it. So I still count that as a success, but only just. Yeah, that, that's tough. Yeah, and like I was yeah. one, one of my early eclipses in Mongolia. We tried to outrun the a uh, cold front uh, that was and, and couldn't. That uh, it, uh, it it was snowing uh, during during totality, and then when we went back, we left some people behind at the, at uh, the place where we had breakfast, and they said, "Oh yeah, we saw this beautiful eclipse." So all, we could have stayed, had a nice breakfast, and seen totality, and instead we tried to, tried to outrun the weather and couldn't. <laughs> yeah. It's a, 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 your comment that they should have should have sent some boats, even if they just had one or two people to go to another location. That would have been quite a sensible uh, backup. But uh, it, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've seen someone raise a hand a few times, um, just in case people, basically, because this is a Zoom webinar. The people who, who join, you won't be able to speak. But what you can do is type questions in the Q&A, or if you can't get to the Q&A, you can type them in the chat.
so I think I've also expanded my vocabulary tonight. Uh, uh, contrologist, contrologist, I hadn't become before, although make, that makes sense for somebody who studies shells. But magnibus, I shall definitely use as a sort of uh, opposite opposite of minibus. And of course, Steve, it would must have been horse drone in those days. So quite quite different to the buses that we use to today. Yes, indeed. Well, I said, but bus comes from omnibus, doesn't it, for everybody? So uh, it's uh, it's the same same concept, but just different different source of power. Yeah, it it did strike me how the kind of the only way to get to that eighteen seventy one eclipse was by boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not only no plane, but yeah, the roads wouldn't, of course, wouldn't have uh, been I, to get there. So it's a, a different a different way of life. Would Melbourne to yeah. Sydney would that have been overland, or could you, uh, or was the uh, boat the best place to get, best way to get from the from the between the two colonies? It would still have been ship by ship. Um, the two of them were not joined by rail until eighteen eighty three, and due to fantastic planning, they managed to have different gauges. In different in Victoria and New South Wales, one had an Irish gauge, and one had a British gauge, and uh, so uh, that was uh, necessary to change at to, uh, uh, to change at the border between the two states. And there's a town called Albury where they had people had to had to change trains. Uh, I remember having to do this. I think for, you know, when I. Uh, Done that trip in the past. Um, in more recent times, uh, there is now the same gauge all the way through, but still, rail allowed trans for the first time easy transport between the cities. Uh, so, well, but before eighteen eighty three, I would have I would imagine it was by ship was my best and easiest way of uh, of doing it. I mean, they they really were separate colonies. They could have become completely different countries, couldn't they? If uh, it had things had that slightly differently. But they they were actually so in the eighteen fifties they became self governing. Um, if, until until then they were ruled from the from Britain by uh, by a governor. Um, then they became self governing in the eighteen sometime in the different states at different times in the eighteen. 1850s. I think uh, uh, our bus driver in Western Australia was telling us that Western Australia has tried to secede a couple of occasions <laughs> from the from the rest of Australia. They are rather more separate than uh, than <laughs> than the East Coast. That's right. The first time I was in uh, in Perth, I uh, people asked me, "Are you from the East?" <laughs> and I would think, "Why would you think that? I'm I'm not a I'm not a." I'd look at you. But why would you say that? That I, that I realised to them that the east is uh, is it's, uh, the eastern states, whether it's Victoria or New South Wales. Any questions on that? Uh, no, nothing coming in on Zoom or YouTube. I was going to say, if people want to know more about the uh, the eclipses in 1868, when they when they, I, I think, which is almost a sort of watershed moment when the the science took over. I think from almost from the yeah, stopped being astronomy and started being astrophysics. Uh, Wayne Orchiston's yes. talk was, uh, it, it was it was very good on that both both the science and and the politics. That uh, mm. uh, in uh, in Wayne's case, because he's he lectured to us from Thailand at uh, uh, very. Uh, the, the, the king of the king of Siam at the time played off the European powers against each other. It was, it was that great opportunity to do some diplomacy, uh, and and further west in in India they were busy finding you know busy finding helium, the helium line and doing all these eclipse expeditions were doing real real useful science pushing things on. And, you know, the, 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 I'm sure had it clear in 1871. Uh, further advances would have would have happened from from uh, from Australia. Do you know if there were other expeditions uh, outside Australia in, in 1871? 71. Not that I know of. No. I'm not sure how much further whether the track covered, you know, uh, Indonesia or uh, it would have been Dutch East Indies or whatever it is at the time, or out into the Pacific. Yeah, there was a contribution 
financial contribution from the South Australian government, but as far as I know, nobody from South Australia was uh, was on the expedition. Okay, uh, well, um, if there are no questions further on the line, uh, I think we can uh, we can wrap things up. Um, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for uh, for getting up early and uh, telling us <laughs> telling us all about the eclipse. We do we do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, telling us all about the uh, about these uh, Australian eclipses and the and the way that uh, the way that they fit into the history. You know, the way that the colonies started coming together, and this is one of the things that that glued them together. They become the Australia that we now know. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to to have this was so we could publicise you know, the, the the wonderful eclipse that's going to happen in uh, in just five years time now, 2028, across the whole of Australia. But as you say, the most photogenic place on the whole way will be Sydney Harbour, the bridge and the Opera House. It's a beautiful yeah. city. If if you do go to see the eclipse. Do make sure that you visit the Sydney Observatory. It's it, almost in the shadow of the harbour of the of the bridge, isn't it? It's a it's a lovely location, isn't it? The Lord Nelson pub as well, just across the road from the uh, from the observatory. I think yeah, down, down the hill, down yeah, the hill just, from the just just from down the, the hill. I, 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 I recommended by me and by many of my uh, my engineering friends who uh, who visited Sydney uh, at the Powerhouse Museum. I, the last time I was in Sydney, I had to I met up uh, with Turner and Andrew Jacob from the Powerhouse. They showed me around. A, a wonderful a wonderful. Uh, I was going to say science museum, but it's so much more than that. It's a, it, it's sort of natural natural history, philosophy, a natural philosophy museum, a, a, a great deal to it. So that's that's uh, pretty close to Sydney Station, very very close to the centre of the city. So there is a lot to see in Sydney, and uh, I know you are, you've been involved with the, with both establishments over the years. So thank you so yes. much for talking to us, and um, uh, and uh, thank you to, thank you to everybody who uh, listened in tonight or or watching it uh, uh, on the on, on the repeat on the YouTube channel. So uh, thank you very much and good night to you all. Or oh, good day. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Mike.